It's week 12 of 2022. I'm Smitha Naj. This is your weekly fix. It is exactly a month to the day Russia invaded Ukraine. In this period, the US, Europe, and other countries have imposed a host of economic sanctions on Russia. But Russian oil and gas exports, the revenues from which make up a third of the country's national budget, have largely been spared. Sure, America earlier this month banned the import of Russian oil and gas, but these imports were relatively small. 45% of the European Union's gas imports and 25% of its oil imports are met by Russia, which explains Europe's reluctance to follow the US in banning Russia's oil and gas. India is the world's third largest oil importer. More than 80% of our energy needs are met by imports. But Russia makes up less than 1% of our total imports. So, who do we get our oil from? Till 2017-18, Iran was India's third largest supplier, meeting 10% of our total needs. American sanctions closed that option. India's oil imports from Venezuela also dropped considerably following U.S. sanctions on the South American nation. In 2020-21, Iraq was India's biggest oil supplier, followed by Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Nigeria was the fourth largest supplier and the U.S. the fifth. So, is the global energy order changing? What will it mean for us? What does India, considering the Russian offer of discounted crude, Mean, India has already abstained from the UN Security Council and the UNG awards condemning the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Will taking Russia up on its offer invite secondary sanctions on India? Will the present crisis accelerate energy transition from fossil fuels to renewables? Let's ask Vikram Singh Mehta. He is chairman and distinguished fellow at the Center for Social and Economic Progress. He was the executive chairman of Brookings India, before which he was the chairman of the Shell Group of Companies in India. Mr. Mehta, thank you for making the time for speaking to us here at Scroll. Thank you. Now, uh, given the following facts, only Americans have imposed a ban on oil imports. As it were, its oil imports from Russia were relatively small. Additionally, there is no EU ban on Russian oil imports. There are no US sanctions on Russian oil exports. Would it be correct to assume that as long as it stays like this, there is no, will be no major systemic shock? Or, or will there be a knock-on effect? I think that would be uh, an optimistic assumption um, because the systemic shock is not just going to happen because of the physical supply of oil. It is also dependent on the speculative trade by Wall Street and other trading exchanges. So the fundamentals of the oil market are determined by supply and demand uh, and geopolitics. But then there are, you might say, some non-fundamentals that influence the trajectory of the oil market. And those are um, exchange rates uh, and the trading positions of the, of the traders. Hmm. So uh, were Russian crude oil, which accounts for you know, about 5 million barrels a day into the oil market, do we cut off completely? the price of oil would certainly ratchet up, possibly up to $150 a barrel, who knows. Mm. Uh, But were the situation in Ukraine to drag on and the uncertainties associated with the conflict uh, deepen, then also you might see the crude oil market uh, facing a crisis, further crisis or a deepening crisis because the traders and the, the consumers will will hedge for the unexpected. Yes. So it's not only the the, the, the the systemic shock that you're referring to could happen because of factors unrelated to the sanctions on Russian oil. Okay. Uh, if you could focus on India for a bit, what would you say are the challenges posed specifically to India's energy security as of today? Um, for those of our listeners unfamiliar with the term, uh, 
straightforward definition of energy security would be having access to a stable and affordable supply of energy uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, Mr. Mehta. So India is facing a twin uh, challenge. There is the challenge of dependence on oil and gas imports up to 85% of our requirements. Hmm. And then there is the challenge of managing the dependence on imports of minerals and components like solar cells and batteries for effectuating our transition from fossil fuels to clean energy. Yes. So India is in a particularly vulnerable position right now because it is exposed to the, the dynamics of the geopolitics of fossil fuels, and it is also exposed to the geopolitics of new energy. Right. Um, so that is the basic problem that we face. What do we do about that? There is no one, one point sort of response to that question. But there are a series of decisions and, and actions that the government could take to mitigate this vulnerability. First and foremost, we have to diversify our sources of supply of fossil fuels. Hmm. Second is we need to reduce the consumption of oil and increase the consumption of gas so that our dependence on crude oil imports from the Middle East is reduced and we are able to source gas from a multiple of uh, suppliers that are not located in the Middle East so that we are hedged against the political or geopolitical tensions in the Middle East. Right. That's a first step. The second is that we should deepen our strategic reserves. Today we have strategic reserves of around 5 million tons that can meet 9 to 10 days of our consumption requirements. Hmm. The average that the international agency, uh, energy agency recommends for import con countries is to have a 90-day strategic reserves. Hmm. I think that would be a step too far for India at this juncture, given that the creation of strategic reserves is an expensive proposition. But I would certainly recommend that the government look seriously at expanding our strategic reserves to at least 30 days. Okay. So that's the second, I think, very important step. The third is to, let's say, uh, accelerate the development of indigenous reserves of both hydrocarbons and also our minerals. Right. We really need to take a hard look at these challenges that our domestic companies, whether they're private sector or public sector, face in harnessing the indigenous reserves of oil and gas and also in exploring and developing reserves of, of minerals that help us in the clean energy transition. Hmm. And in the latter context, it is particularly important because it will reduce our dependence on China. China has a chokehold on the mineral reserves uh, that are so important for the clean energy transition. And we definitely need to reduce our dependence on China. So that's, a, that's another, um, I think, very important step that we need to take. You spoke about renewables. Um, would these developments, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, hasten the transition from hydrocarbons to renewables? Are we going to see an accelerated energy transition? Uh, yes and no. Uh, so at one level, the price of oil has gone to $115, $120 a barrel. The price of gas in Europe has never been so high. And together, this is really compelling countries to hasten the transition because they want to move away from fossil fuels as quickly as possible. Right. Uh, at another level, it has also, uh, of course, had the opposite effect. It has encouraged companies to reopen their coal mines uh, because that's a cheaper source. Hmm. Uh, and that's the worry I have is that in, in the effort to reduce the price of fuel to the consumer, 
many countries are going to take the politically expedient step to either delay the closure of coal mines or increase the production of coal uh, from the existing mines. And so there you might have a completely opposite effect. Correct. A lot of the oil companies now putting pressure on their financial investors to allow them to continue with their investments in oil and gas. Yes. The oil companies are saying to Wall Street, to their financial investors, there's been substantial underinvestment in the supply of oil and gas, and that is compounding the crisis that has been created by the Ukrainian-Russian sort of situation. Okay, I have a couple of questions about how India is dealing with this sanctions situation. Uh, now, Russia has only been a marginal supplier of oil to India, but uh, how do you view how do you view New Delhi's consideration of taking up the Russian offer to buy crude at discounted rates? Uh, is this pragmatic, Mr. Mehta? As in, do we run the risk of inviting secondary sanctions? Uh, also, is it morally right? Let me start with the moral question. It would be morally wrong for India or for any company or for an individual to profit from a humanitarian tragedy of the dimensions that we are seeing in Ukraine. It would be morally wrong for us to put profits ahead of our principles and our values. Yes. Now, now the question is related to the specifics, and there are two aspects to that question. Let me try and address them. One is, should India buy crude oil from Russia? And in my view, the answer is that it is pragmatic and morally defensible for India to buy crude oil from Russia. The reason why I say this is as follows. One, India is buying crude oil at the market price. Everyone is talking about a discount. I would like to use the word market price. Why? Because the price of Russian crude has fallen because they're not able to sell it in the marketplace. As the, there are very few buyers and the price has fallen. So the first point is India is buying crude in the market. It's not profiting by exploiting a particular situation as such. It's doing an arm's length deal with Russia. Hmm. If someone wants to buy Russian crude today, they can buy it at the price that India bought it. Hmm. Second is that if India did not buy and if Russian crude was sanctioned, uh, it, the price of oil internationally would ratchet up to beyond $150 a barrel. And that would compound the humanitarian tragedies that we're seeing in Ukraine. Hmm. You know, the poor in India would suffer, the poor all over the world would suffer, okay? Mm. Third is that there is, that it is imperative from our security, national security and in energy security angle to be able to access energy uh, in an affordable and reliable manner. Right. This is exactly the logic that has driven Europe from continuing to purchase crude oil from Russia. They have condemned the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but they continue to buy Russian crude because as the finance minister of Germany said, I think it's the finance minister, that were we not to buy crude, there would be chaos in Germany. So I am clear that this is a morally defensible. What would sorry, not be- Sorry, you were saying, sorry, you were saying what would not be morally defensible. Please continue. What would not be morally defensible is if India decided to buy the assets that have been left behind by the international majors that have withdrawn from Russia, like Shell, Exxon, BP, at 10 cents or 20 cents on the dollar. That, I think, would be exploiting the current crisis for a profitable opportunistic gain. And I would not condone that. So what do I mean? I mean, if Exxon's shareholding in Sakhalin 1, hmm. where Exxon has 20% and they've left it, 
if we need to buy Exxon shares because it's now literally, uh, you know, on the market at uh, at a, you know, for, for for almost for free, then I think we could not defend it. Okay. Okay. Right. If India was to buy BP shares in Rosneft, I don't think I would I would defend it. I could not defend it. Hmm. So I'm making a distinction between purchase of crude oil on the open market at the market price and the purchase of assets in Russia, in Russia at a discounted price or at, at an impaired price. Fair enough. Um, since we're in the territory of political expediency, uh, I wonder what you make of reports that the U.S. is looking at Iran and Venezuela, both countries squeezed by American sanctions, to make up for some of the supply shortfall. Well, America's uh, initiative in Venezuela is, has been reported in the press. I don't know if it is factually correct or not, so let me just start with that caveat. If it is factually correct, then I think it reflects poorly on America. Uh, you cannot lecture the world, you cannot tell India that we are on the wrong side of history and at the same time go cap in hand to a country that they do not recognize and to a leader that they do not recognize. Right. And the irony is that they purchased or they contracted to buy Russian crude to fill the gap created by their sanctions on Venezuelan crude. Hmm. You know, the crude that they were buying from Venezuela, they replaced that with Russian crude. Now they've sanctioned Russian crude, they're going back to Venezuela. Right. Now, if that is indeed the case, then I, I think that's, that's very difficult to understand. And it certainly doesn't square with the principles that they have espoused or that they would like other countries to follow. Quite right. Uh, Mr. Mehta, thank you for aiding our understanding of the potential volatility in the energy market and the changing geopolitics of oil. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.